Good day, my name is Jocelyn Katz. I'm a director in the Competition Law Department of Edward Nathan Sonnenbergs in Johannesburg. I'm here today to talk to you about the Comersa Merger Assessment Guidelines published by Comersa in October 2014. The guidelines are effective as a date of publication and address the notifiability requirements for mergers as well as the substantive analysis of mergers under the Comersa regime. Please note, however, that the guidelines are for guidance only and should not be relied on as a statement of law. Given that these guidelines are 61 pages long, I'm not going to deal with all of them in detail. I am going to pick out certain aspects for you that I consider to be of particular importance. Therefore, for a full understanding of the commercial competition regime, please have regard to the 2013 presentation in the second edition Competition Law Observatory, as well as the commercial competition regulations 2004, and the guidelines themselves. The Commercial Regulations and the Guidelines are available at www.commercialcompetition.org. The Guidelines reiterate ENS's previous understanding of the definition of a merger and provide that Article 23.1 defines a merger as the direct or indirect acquisition or establishment of a controlling interest by one or more persons in the whole or part of the business of a competitor, supplier, customer or other person. Article 23.2 defines a controlling interest as any interest which enables the holder thereof to exercise directly or indirectly any control whatsoever over the activities or assets of the undertaking. There is also a very broad definition of controlling interest. The guideline reiterates that minority protections may in fact be included and provides more certainty provided to the concept of control. The Commission regards control as being constituted by rights, contracts or any other means which either separately or in combination and having regard to the considerations of fact or law involved confer the possibility of exercising decisive influence on the undertaking or asset concerned. Now whether or not a person has the ability to exercise decisive influence on an undertaking or asset concerned should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. The guidelines set out certain factors that need to be considered whether, when determining whether or not a person exercises directly or indirectly control over an undertaking or asset. A person will be considered to control a firm if that person either directly or indirectly has the ability to determine a majority of votes that may be cast at a general meeting of the undertaking, is able to appoint or veto the appointment of a majority of directors of the undertaking, has the ability to determine the appointment of senior management, strategic commercial policy, the budget or the business plan of the undertaking, or has a controlling interest in an intermediary undertaking that in turn has a controlling interest in the undertaking. Two additional points to note regarding control as set out in the guidelines. Purely contractual means of control for limited durations will not be regarded as meeting the definition of a merger. In addition, in relation to a joint venture, only joint ventures that are full function joint ventures will consider to meet the definition of a merger. In relation to jurisdiction, Article 23.3a of the regulations require that both the acquiring and target undertakings or either of them operate in two or more member states. However, the guidelines make clear that merger control by the Commission only concerns mergers having a regional dimension with an appreciable effect on trade between member states and which restricts competition. In this regard, a merger will only be notifiable to the Commission if a target undertaking operates in a member state. Now, an undertaking is deemed to operate in a member state if it has an annual turnover or assets in the member state exceeding five million US dollars. Or, at least one merging party operates in two or more member states and it is not the case that more than two-thirds of the annual turnover in the common market of each of the merging parties is achieved or held within one and the same member state. In relation to the calculation of turnover or assets for the merger thresholds, they seem to have followed very much the South African approach. So the acquiring group is defined as the acquiring firm and anything that it controls, namely the undertaking concerned, the subsidiaries, meaning those undertakings in which the undertaking concerned has solely or jointly with one or more persons a controlling right, together with the subsidiaries of those subsidiaries, and so on. As well as its parents, meaning those undertakings of which the undertaking concerned is a subsidiary um, as set out uh, above, 
and any other subsidiaries of its parents not included in the above. So in other words, it includes the entire acquiring group. A target undertaking means the target itself, as well as any subsidiaries of the target that may constitute part of the firm uh, going across to the acquiring group and is defined as follows. Its subsidiaries, meaning those undertakings in which the undertaking concerned has, solely or jointly with one or more persons, a controlling right together with the subsidiaries of those subsidiaries, and so on. The guidelines set out um, a pre-notification process whereby the Commission will allow for a pre-merger consultation um, where parties may by phone or in person or by any other means talk to the Commission about specific issues of which they may have concerns um, and enable the parties to a merger to get clarity. Issues like whether or not the transaction is notifiable, whether it comprises a merger as defined, the calculation or the correct calculation of annual turnover or assets, market shares, uh, filing fee and how it's calculated, which information specifically the Commission may require to be provided in comfort letters, um, the requirements of the Form 12 itself, um, as well as availability or unavailable of specific information, and uh, requests for confidential treatment of uh, business secrets of the merging parties. The next section deals with comfort letters. The guidelines have introduced a process in terms of which the Commission will receive comfort letters. In this regard, an acquiring party may alone or jointly with other parties request a comfort letter determining that a merger is not a notifiable merger because it would not have an appreciable effect on trade between member states or restrict uh, com competition in the common market. Now, the request must be received by the Commission no later than 30 days after the merging party's decision to merge. Now, within 21 days after receipt of the comfort letter request, the Commission will either confirm that no merger is required or request specific information and uh, fix a time period in which that information is to be provided or inform the merging parties that a merge notification is in fact required. If the Commission requested further information, the Commission will respond to the requesting party with its determination within 14 calendar days after receiving such further information. If, however, the Commission determines that a merger notification is required, Unless the parties that submitted the comfort letter notifies the Commission within 14 days that it does not wish to submit a notification, the submission of the comfort letter request to the Commission will be deemed submission of a notification, as at the date on which the comfort letter was submitted. The notifying party will then be required within 30 calendar days to supplement the comfort letter request by submitting a completed Form 12 and all supporting documents or be deemed to have failed to make a timely submission. The next section deals with the calculation of the filing fee. Now, the guidelines set out that the Commission will calculate the merger filing fee by looking at the lower of 0.5% of the combined annual turnover or combined value of assets, whichever is higher in the common market, and 500,000 Commesa dollars, which, as you know, equates to 500,000 US dollars. The Commission will calculate the notification fee and issue an invoice to the notifying party no later than seven days after a notification is deemed submitted. Even if it's issued earlier, an invoice will not be effective until after a notification is deemed submitted and, in fact, deemed submitted in its complete form. If the Commission requires additional information from the parties to calculate the filing fee, it will request such information from the notifying party fix a time limit for submission for such information and calculate the notification fee and issue an invoice to the notifying party no later than seven days after the information is received. Now the fee payment must be received within seven days after the date on which the invoice is issued or if later, seven days after the invoice becomes effective. A fee payment will be deemed to be received by the Commission on the date that a cheque or money order in payment of that fee is delivered to the Commission provided that the payment clears within 14 days, or the date that a direct deposit or an electronic transfer of funds in the amount of the fee is credited to the account of the Commission. In the event that parties to a merger ultimately abandon a merger, unfortunately the Commission will not be refunding the filing fee. Now, the guidelines provide some clarity in relation to the merger notification process. They also provide clarity on the meaning of decision to merge as per Article 24.1 of the regulation. The Commission considers that a decision to merge must either be a joint decision taken by the parties and so comprise the conclusion of a definitive legally binding agreement to carry out the merger, which may or may not be subject to conditions precedent, 
or the announcement of a public bid in the case of public traded, publicly traded securities. Importantly, for the purposes of compliance with the 30 calendar day deadline in Article 241, the notification will be deemed to have been submitted to the Commission upon the Commission's receipt of an email to the Commission, to the Commission's prescribed email address, attaching or otherwise providing electronic access to Form 12 and all supporting documents in PDF format, and including the email addresses of each party comprising the notifying party, or submitting an electronic version of the Form 12 and all supporting documents in PDF form or CD or DVD-ROM format. One hard copy of the Form 12 and all supporting documents should be sent to the Commission within seven days thereafter. If there are any discrepancies between the hard copy version and the electronic version received, the electronic version will be um, deemed the true reflection of the transaction. A notification will be deemed complete on the date when all of the information and supporting documentation required under Form 12 are received by the Commission. Within 14 calendar days after a notification is deemed submitted to the Commission and the merger notification fee is received, the Commission will examine the merger notification for completeness and either issue a certificate of complete filing or indicate to the merging parties that there is further information required and fix a time limit for that information to be provided to the Commission. Now that the guidelines have provided some clarity on what a decision to merge means, they have provided for a period of immunity. In other words, parties that may have failed to meet the deadline prior to the guidelines being issued now have a period of 90 days in which to submit a filing uh, in respect of the mergers, 90 days that is from the publication of the guidelines. So within seven days of submitting the merger notification, the Commission will publish on its website the fact of the merger, the parties concerned, their countries of origin, the nature of the merger and the economic sectors involved. They will also prepare and submit a summary to all of the relevant member states, including relevant information provided in the merger notification. Now in relation to confidential information, Merging parties may submit a request for confidentiality in Form 2. The Commission will consider the request and if it determines that disclosure of such information or documents or parts thereof would likely result in disclosure of business secrets, destruction or appreciable diminution of the commercial value of any information or cause serious injury, it will confirm within a reasonable time to the party concerned that it will indeed treat such information or documents as confidential and not disclose them publicly. The Commission will only disclose information or documents designated as confidential to a member state or authority of a member state or any other nation where such member state or authority is obligated to respect the confidentiality of such information or documents. The next relevant section of the guidelines deals with referrals to member states. Now, Articles 24.8 and 24.9 of the regulations indicate that a member state may request the Commission to refer a merger to it for consideration under the Member State's National Competition Law. If such Member State is satisfied that the merger, if carried out, is likely to disproportionately reduce competition to a material extent in such Member State or any part of such Member State. Member States should make referral requests within 14 calendar days after receiving the summary of the merger from the Commission. Now, within seven days after receiving such a request from a Member State, the Commission will publish details pertaining to the referral request on its website. Interested parties can then make uh, reasoned submissions to the Commission within seven calendar days after such publication regarding whether or not it should refer the whole or part of the merger to the Member State Authority. Within 21 calendar days after receiving a referral request from a Member State, the Commission will, pursuant to Article 24.9, make a decision and inform the Member State as to whether it will deal with the merger itself or refer the merger in whole or in part to the Member State. Happily, in the event that all or part of a merger is in fact referred to a Member State, the Commission considers that the parties to an implemented merger notified in accordance with the regulations and these guidelines should not, just by virtue of this matter being referred to a Member State, be penalised for having implemented the merger um, or, in fact, for not previously notifying the merger to the Member State. The Commission will then publish its decisions on referral requests on its website within seven calendar days after issuing the decision to a Member State. The next relevant section of the guidelines deals with the assessment of mergers. Now, as required under Article 25.1, the Commission will make a decision on a merger within 120 days after receiving the notification. 
Such a period of course commences on the date on which a complete notification has been received by the Commission. The Commission has considered there to be Phase 1 and Phase 2 investigations. In relation to a Phase 1 investigation, the assessment of the merger ends 45 calendar days after the commencement of the review period. If during Phase 1 the Director of the Commission determines on a balance of probabilities that the merger is not more likely than not to give rise to substantial lessening prevention of competition and that there are no reasonable grounds for believing that additional evidence or further assessment could lead to the reversal of this determination, then before the expiry of Phase 1 the Commission will issue to the notifying party and publish on its website a decision declaring that it does not object to the merger. Phase 2 investigations work as follows. If during Phase 1 the Director determines on a balance of probabilities that the merger is more likely than not to give rise to a substantial lessening prevention of competition, or that there are reasonable grounds for believing that additional evidence or further assessment could lead to a reversal of the, termina the determination, then before the expiry of Phase 1, the Commission will issue to the notifying party and publish on its website a decision to proceed to Phase 2, whereupon Phase 1 will immediately expire and Phase 2 will commence the following day. Phase 2 will continue then until the end of the 120-day calendar period. During the period, the Director will submit a report to the Committee, who will then make a determination which will be issued to the notifying party and published on the Commission's website. If the Director fails to issue the determination or fails to notify the notifying party that the notification was improper and the merger has not been wholly referred to a member state, then the merger in question is deemed to have been approved. The final section I'm going to deal with is the section on appeals. Now, the guidelines provide that any person aggrieved by the decision of the committee will have the right to appeal to the board within 30 calendar days after publication of the decision. Within 14 calendar days after receipt of an appeal to the board, the Commission will publish on its website the names of the parties to the appeal, a reference to the decision which is being appealed, and a copy of the appeal to the board as submitted. Interested parties and the Commission may make reasoned submissions relating to the appeal within 30 calendar days after date of publication. The board will issue a decision on the appeal within 90 calendar days after the date of publication. The Commission will publish such decision on its website within seven calendar days after its issuance. The decision will also subsequently be published in the board's official publication. Now, if the board annuls the whole or part of a Commission decision, subject to the conditions of any annulment, the Commission will re-examine the merger in light of the then prevailing market conditions. It may require the notifying party to amend and restate or supplement the original notification where the original notification becomes incomplete or erroneous. Where there are no such changes, the notifying party must certify this fact without delay. The Commission will complete such re-examination within 45 calendar days after receipt of such certification or the amended and restated or supplemented notification. So in conclusion, the guidelines have gone a long way in providing certainty on various issues previously faced with the Commerce merger control regime. It's important to remember, however, that these guidelines are for general guidance only and should not be relied on as a statement of law. As I mentioned before, this presentation highlights only certain salient aspects that I've identified as important features of the guidelines. But please do refer to the website for the full guidelines. Thank you very much.